I'm so thrilled that we are here, uh, that we are healthy, and that we're all here um, together. Because as some folks may know, some folks may not know, this is actually our first in-person town hall in two years. I think there are a lot of things that we learned, even in the transition to remote, uh, that we also want to make sure that we preserve. And so for our neighbors with disabilities, our neighbors with, uh, with children, family, traveling, we have also preserved our ability to you know, uh, join us remotely via live stream. And we also have our ASL interpretation. So I'd like to thank all of our interpreters here today. So we have language support services, Seattle's Español, um, and if, if you speak, what language is that today? Fondo and Spanish. Fondo and Spanish. So Seattle's Español, or oh, I need to learn how to say that in front of us. But um, but if you speak Fondo and you prefer to hear this in either Spanish or Fondo, we have our interpreters out in the back. If they could raise their hand, um, you can just get a, a headset from one of them will be able to live translate uh, our town hall. So in addition to that, uh, our folks online can also have um, closed captioning on our live stream as well. So all that is to say is thank you all so much for joining us today in person, and thanks to everybody looking right in here. Thanks to everybody for joining us uh, on the live stream. So I'll get to it because uh, if you have or if you haven't, if this is your first town hall with us joining it, Join us if it's your time. Uh, we hold a town hall every single month. Um, when I was, uh, when I first went into office, uh, one of the core promises that I made to our community is that every single month we will host a town hall. Every single month you have the opportunity to engage with us in this way. There's a lot of other opportunities as well, but a monthly town hall has been very important. So we've held. Um, it's been two years, about 24 town halls during the pandemic, but this is our first one in person. And so I wanted to make sure that we covered a, a decent scope. And at the beginning of this month, uh, President Biden delivered his State of the Union. And I figured we should deliver after two years of our, our State of the District so that you all can kind of understand exactly what's happening in the RFPA community. So I'm going to go through some of that. It's going to take a little bit because it's been a little while, and then we're going to move to a QA. So, the first thing that I wanted us to start off with is that two weeks ago, we actually were able to secure a community project funding for the first time in over a decade uh, in, in the House, and the past the Senate, and the Senate and the President. And so, what does that mean for us? That means that um, us together as a community and my office have led over or rather about 10 community projects in our district with concentrated investments in our community. I'm going to breeze through what some of those things are, but I'm going to focus a little bit on the first one. Because when I speak to a lot of you, when we have a, a lot of conversations in the community, we talk a lot, a lot of conversations going on about public safety. What's happening with crime, what's happening with incidents of violence, the subway, etc. And this is something that we're really, really invested in tackling. And a lot of times you hear this debate uh, revert immediately into issues of bail, this, that, leasing, etc. But one of the things that I want us to talk about is some of the investments that we can make in terms of causes of crime and how we can actually tackle that to reduce incidents from happening in the first place. And so we started looking at this. And this increase in crime started happening uh, in, a, in a pretty, in, in this concentrated way uh, in 2020 and then really last year. So we started hitting up Jacoby Medical Center, which you'll see is that little dot right up there. And we started hitting up Jacoby Medical Center, where they have developed a really innovative violence interruption program called Stand Up to Violence. I think it's really important that everybody uh, knows about this. So what happens at Jacoby is that if someone in our community 
uh, is admitted to Jacoby Hospital with a stab wound, with a, um, with a bullet wound, etc. There are certain types of injuries that get automatically flagged at the ER because there, there are injuries that are pretty much injuries due to violence. Domestic violence, like all sorts of other types of um, incidents as well. And what they find is that we've developed a new approach to public safety where you not only get an ER doctor to stitch you up, but if you're admitted due to an instance of violence, a social worker is called, a psychiatrist is called, and they go right into that emergency room to do psychological and social interventions at the hospital. And so we, we started with this experiment. And we said, you know, folks at Jacoby said, just give us a couple people. And right now, usually what happens is that the nexus of response to that happens from the jail. Someone gets arrested, that's when all the people are called, etc. They said, just give us a couple of people who we want to see something. And they said, what happens if we made that response nexus the hospital and treat violence as a public health issue? And what we found is that when we did that, Doctors and public health officials started studying the data, and they said, look what happens. A huge proportion of people who are referred in incidents of violence are suffering and struggling from severe mental health issues. A lot of them are struggling with their housing status, and a very large degree of them are young men, about teenagers to about 25 or 27. That gives us a lot more clarity in terms of what we can hone in on and target. And so we call on social workers. What we've also done is hired out mentors, so people who have, who have made mistakes in their past. Perhaps they spent time in Rikers, but they've turned their life around. No one knows better how to turn their life around than someone who's been there. They get paid. As, as experts in this, to mentor these young, young men, young women, young people in general, to, to help them transition out of that life. And what we have found at Jacoby Medical Center is that it has decreased, for, for the folks that are able to access this program, it has decreased reoccurrence of crime by over 50%. By over 50%. most effective intervention at reducing reoccurrence of violence that we know of. It's more effective than any other mental health, health, policing, any uh, public policy intervention that we have on the books so far. And so what we did two weeks ago, and this journey started about last year, was that we secured another half a million dollars to invest in the Jacoby Medical Center program. Um, in order to get this done, because now it's now that we know that it works. The issue is that we need to get this borough wide. We need to get this into all of our communities. We need to secure that kind of intervention. So what we did was that we secured about uh, four hundred thousand dollars for Jacoby Medical Center to get more social workers, to get more mentors, to get more people. And then, by the way, it also helps people rebuild their lives as well because. We have very little, uh, very little of the social scaffolding or safety net for someone who is leaving our carceral system. And so when people talk about the school to pipeline, school to prison pipeline, we also have a school to prison to shelter pipeline because there's no resources for someone to be able to find housing for their life together. So this has been enormously successful. We've been able to do that. Um, we also secured, really exciting, also here in the Bronx, about $800,000, almost a million dollars, for the first Green New Deal project in the United States. <laughs> what was the Green New Deal all about? Two years ago, we introduced it. They said, this is pie in the sky. This is impossible. This is unrealistic. Well, the Green New Deal is about three things. It's about decarbonizing and, and getting our carbon levels and emission levels down so that we can stop contributing to climate change. It's about environmental justice and focusing on communities impacted by environmental injustice and environmental racism like ours. Because 
not everyone experiences the kind of pollution that black, brown, low income, and working class communities do. The Bronx is one of the highest childhood asthma rates in the United States. And it's not by accident. It's because the way that we build our infrastructure brings trucking, shipping, diesel fumes, all of that into our air. And it's structured in a way that is concentrated here in our community. And so by decarbonizing our emissions, we also can help tackle incidents of childhood and adult asthma. Um, but the third, so the, uh, the first part is about you know, the science, decarbonization. The second part is about tackling environmental justice, including creating economic opportunities, which brings us to our third point, which is creation of good jobs that lead us to good union jobs that have benefits, a high salary, not just minimum wage, and actually have a path to being able to support your family and your life. And so what this $800,000 project is, is going to do is that it's going to be based in Throgs Neck. And we're partnering with Maritime College in Throgs Neck. And we're going to create jobs for people in the community. And it trains, and uh, it's a job training program to train people in how to construct uh, wind turbines for offshore wind here in New York. And so our community, our folks, are going to start getting trained in jobs, in construction, and also really sophisticated techniques. Because we're not just talking about putting you know, the, the turbines together at the top, but offshore wind is about constructing the pylons, those cement pylons. Uh, you know, that go underwater, that's, that's it compared to a lot of really sophisticated uh, engineering and construction. And so our community is going to get training in how to do that, and that is a very desirable and in-demand skill that they're going to be able to carry with them for the rest of their lives and their career. So really, really excited about that. So that's what we've got in terms of um, offshore wind. Uh, we also also serving here in the Bronx is that we have sixty thousand dollars to uh, Emerald Isle. I don't know if you're on this uh, map or maybe I'm uh, but Emerald Isle Immigration Center. Oh, you're right here. Um, actually, one hundred and ten uh, for Emerald Isle Immigration Center, and they do a lot of work for a job training for our immigrant communities. On the Queen side of the district, uh, we have secured three million dollars to rebuild the OBGYN unit and tackle the maternal health crisis with black and brown women in our community. Um, and we're so excited about this uh, because, I mean, we have a maternal mortality crisis and it's impacting our communities differently. And one of the reasons why we picked Jacoby and we picked Elmhurst Hospital is because, in case you don't know, Jacoby and Elmhurst are public hospitals. And so what that means is that they will never turn you away based on your insurance status, your documentation status, the, your, your health care, whatever it may be, your income, your housing. Our two public hospitals in our community, Elmhurst and Jacoby, will never turn you away. They will never turn you away. And we believe that for hospitals and our public hospitals that serve our community unconditionally, they deserve the investment. They deserve a rebuilt, brand new OBGYN unit, and it's not going to be walled off just for people who have really nice insurance. <laughs> for the hospital. 
And then now that they raised 14, the city is now looking for a 60, looking at a 60 million dollar grant. And so what started as our effort to renovate the OBGYN uh, wing now looks like it may expand to an entire women's pavilion uh, for <laughs> on providing care to women and girls starting from uh, pubescent and prepubescent girls all the way to end of life. And not only does it include and direct reproductive care, but it's also gender inclusive and will also provide gender affirming and HRT care uh, for our, our non binary and trans brothers and sisters. So, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of other ones here. We've got a uh, uh, $2 million grant for housing access for Chaya CDC, which provides a lot of housing counseling, uh, particularly language support for our South Asian brothers and sisters, our Bengali, Pakistani Indian, and, and uh, more South Asian communities. Um, we have uh, home health aid training, job training programs, college access programs, um, and we're also investing in some shoreline uh, infrastructure as well. So we're really excited about those community funding projects. And it took a long time, it took over a year of us um, fighting and pushing, but we finally got them two weeks ago. But because they took a year, um, it means that the next round is coming up really, really soon. And so we want to start working on our next 10 to 15 investments that we're gonna uh, be fighting for for our community. And so I want you all to know that if you know of a nonprofit organization, if you know of a government adjacent organization, or even if it's not an organization, if you know of a project that really needs to be tackled in our community, let us know. Uh, one of the things that we dealt with last year is that there were some, some folks that had ideas for projects, except we have to have our, our, our ducks in a row in terms of paperwork, there needs to be a nonprofit organization or some other uh, a healthcare organization that actually has like the account and the record and the legitimacy to, to receive, because this is a lot of money, we have to make sure that it is stewarded responsibly. Um, so we want to work with you. Uh, if you have an idea for a project, if you know of a project that people are trying to work on, um, making sure that we're able to work with organizations to get some more of this stuff done. So, we're really, really excited about that, and I want to thank you all because each and every one of these projects came from people in our community that were organizing and have been organizing on this matter for a long time. So I want to thank you all for doing that. Um, next up, uh, in terms of state of the district, I just wanted to do a quick overview on our casework. A lot of people may not know what a member of Congress's office is capable of for you. You know, we look and we know that they that we vote on legislation, that we write it, that we question people in committees. We know that we do that to do town halls, but there are actually very tangible ways that myself and our team can help you directly. If you have a social security check that has gotten lost, if you or a family member have applied for a visa or you've been in a green card process and it's just been stuck and you haven't heard from the agency in like two or three years. If you, um, you know, if you served our country in the armed services and your VA application isn't really uh, lining up correctly, I and our team have the ability to intervene. And so uh, some of the things that we've done, we have closed over 3,800 cases for individuals in our community, and we've gotten $1.8 million back in Social Security and IRS back pay for people here in Montana. So, if you feel like you're owed a stimulus check, if you were moving around and you didn't get it, if, uh, you know, if you were supposed to get a Social Security check for like years, this is uh, we're able to get you back that money. Sometimes it's $500, sometimes it's $1,000, sometimes it's as high as thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that we're able to get back for people. So just know that if you're having this kind of issue, 
part of my job is to help you, and a lot of people don't know that their member of Congress is capable of helping them in that way. Um, in total, um, the, the majority of cases that do come in are immigration related, um, and we've had over 600 federal uh, pandemic unemployment assistance related cases as well, uh, but that's, that's the majority of what we've seen. Um, now, next after that is the matter of redistricting. And I'm sorry if I'm going a little fast, but like I said, we have a lot to catch up on. So last month, you may have heard some things about redistricting. So due to the census, the census happens once every 10 years, and after the census, we have something known as reapportionment. So your member of Congress could change, it could stay the same, or uh, the district that you're in could also change. And so it happens every 10 years, and this year our district was redrawn along with every other district in New York and the country. And this is where we uh, ended up. This is what our new district looks like. I will explain to you who used to be with us and will no longer be with us, and who's now part of our community that wasn't part of our community before. Uh, some notes, though, is that uh, the, the actual district itself does not enact until January of next year. However, when you are voting this year, you are voting for who your member of Congress is going to be next year. So you, when you vote in June and in November, you're voting as if you're in this district, except it's not actually going to kick in until January, until the person you vote for actually takes office. So, um, on the Bronx half of the district, we used to have, so Parkchester is like right here. Um, so this is where we're at, this is Parkchester. Uh, our district now goes out to West Farms. Um, it used to stop right around here. We picked up West Farms and we've also got the Botanical Garden, which is really um, We also have Throb's Neck. We've always had this part of Throb's Neck. However, we lost this this little sliver right here, um, this is now part of New York 3. So Edgewater and Country Club are now part of the new congressional district, um, and they were part of our district. So if you are here and you happen to live in this part of Edgewater or Country Club, I will be a member of Congress until December 31st of this year. And then, or rather until, you know, the new Congress is sworn in, maybe on January 3rd or 6th, usually first week of January. So I'm still your member of Congress for the rest of the year, but at the beginning of next year, um, you're going to be uh, represented by someone. This is also an OPC, so we don't know who that is. Um, this, if you are part of West Farms, I'm not your member of Congress now, but I will be your member of Congress next year. Hopefully. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the Queen's half, we used to have this part of Woodside. That's now part of uh, the neighboring congressional district that's currently represented by uh, Representative Grace Meng. Um, so we lost a, a portion of Woodside, but we picked up Astoria. Astoria used to be divided in two. Um, and so we picked up Astoria, now all the stories are the district. And we also picked up uh, Whitestone as well. So that's those are the shifts in, in our district. Um, and. So, and we also lost, very tragically, the one that breaks my heart is City Island. I tried, I wanted to keep it, I wanted to keep Orchard Beach, I take my dog there, but um, that's also part of New York right now as well. So that's redistricting. Um, just a few last updates for you all to know. One of the things that we did, uh, one of the major breakthroughs that we have was uh, at, the, at the early onset of the pandemic, we started hearing from community leaders and community organizers. And this was early, early, early on. Before the public health data came out, we started hearing from some of our organizers, particularly in East Elmhurst, saying, this is hitting our community harder than everybody else's. Like, they already knew it before the data came out. And they said, in particular, it's hitting our black communities hardest, it's hitting our immigrant communities hardest, and it's hitting a lot of our working class communities hardest. And so they said, the thing is that when you lose one person in your family, if you have an unexpected loss, the cost of funerals are so high. 
And when it comes to COVID, very tragically, some families lost one, two, three people, or sometimes even more. And this is a particular the onset of the pandemic before we had treatments, vaccines, et cetera, that we have today. And so what that means is that if you're a working family and you lose one or two people, not only are you dealing with the tragedy of having that of enormous emotional uh, loss to your family, but it's also a profound spiritual loss. I mean, it's, and it's a profound uh, financial loss as well, because you're talking about Ten up to ten thousand dollars per funeral, and if you lose two, three people, that's twenty, thirty thousand dollars. And if you're a working family, I mean that. I, you know, I in my family we had to deal with that um, when I was younger too. And that's a that's a down payment for a house. That's all. That's just gone overnight. Uh, this could it's just an enormous setback. So one of the things that I led on, uh, thanks to a lot of the work of community leaders out in East Elmhurst was that we developed a $2 billion uh, burial assistance fund for FEMA. We secured the support of Senator Schumer. And what this means is that if you or a loved one have, have lost someone due to COVID-19, the federal government will reimburse 100% of your expenses to laying that person to rest up to $10,000. So, um, if, and, and the program is authorized currently through the end of this year. So just get your receipts, make sure people collect that, and any expense, whether it's uh, putting together a memorial, whether it's repatriating somebody back to their home country, uh, no, no matter the cost or the expense, so long as you have it documented, FEMA can get you those thousands of dollars back so that you can continue to work on processing that emotional loss but you don't have to have that financial burden on top of it. So we were able to see on that um, as well. And we're, we're really, you know, it's it's something that uh, has been enormously impactful and and you know more than two billion dollars has already gone out for, for the program. So we're gonna try to authorize and get more um, to get people the help that they need. So there's that. Um, and then next up we have Ida relief. Uh, we worked, speaking of FEMA, when Hurricane Ida hit last fall, we worked with uh, President Biden uh, to secure one of the fastest approvals of individual assistance in FEMA history. So if you live in a home and your home got flooded, FEMA had disaster assistance uh, provided to you, and we're able to get that assistance extended from September all the way through, I believe, January and February. And so uh, it was one of the fastest experiences that we've gotten. The only two ones that also happened as quickly were on 9-11 and for Hurricane Sandy. So we were able to work overtime to make sure that people got the assistance they made as quickly as possible. Um, we secured $193 million in assistance for 40,000 New Yorkers um, that, that came forward and said that they needed this type of assistance. And now we're also currently working on legislation to FEMA's flexibility and constituent eligibility. Because the thing that we really see is that there's a lot of red tape when it comes to documentation. A lot of times FEMA would decline people the first time, and then we had to help them appeal. And then also we have to address uh, mixed status families. And very often they, uh, mixed status families would have a harder time uh, getting assistance. And so we're working on legislation to make folks' lives easier in that respect. Um, and then uh, the other thing that we did was work with our uh, with our taxi drivers and on um, taxi medallions. Years ago, there was a predatory lending scheme where taxi cab drivers would have to you have to buy a medallion to run a yellow cab in the city, and these medallions had speculative values up to a million dollars. And what predatory banks were doing was that they were creating loans and giving people loans. Million getting putting them into a million dollars in debt when they only have like twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars in annual income. It was predatory and it was wrong. And so we went on the fight uh, to to pressure and organize the city and some of these lenders to issue basically a, a debt jubilee, a bailout for our taxi medallion drivers who were targeted by a predatory lending scheme. 
So what we were able to do is work with the American Rescue Plan, with the city and state funding that was provided, and provide over and provide $500 million in canceled debt for our taxi cab drivers. That we have. $31.5 million in debt reduction. Um, over 250 counties are, are receiving some form of debt relief, and 44% of all taxi cab debt was canceled this past year. So, there's a lot of our drivers right here, and there are neighbors. So, this was a really, really major thing, and also, I hope it proves to everybody that debt. Possible. <laughs> um, people say, oh, this is irresponsible, uh, this is, you know, what kind of precedent does this set, etc. First of all, a little secret, Wall Street folks get debt canceled all the time, okay? Like, let's talk about that. And then, so if Wall Street can get their debt canceled and written off the books, everyday people that are, that are caught up in unjust debt schemes can too. And so we showed it to them. We showed them the tax we've done. We're going to keep pushing it until we get student debt canceled um, because that's an extraordinarily important priority. And then also, if you have medical debt, there was a change made by the Biden administration in the last week or two that it will not show up on the credit report anymore, which is major, major. <laughs> but uh, I sit on three committees. I sit on the Oversight, Government Oversight and Reform Committee. I sit on the Financial Services Committee, which has jurisdiction over housing. And I also sit on a specially created committee just for this term, a uh, select committee on economic disparity. And so we're able to, you know, uh, introduce legislation of all sorts, from all sorts of committees. But if you feel like you have a concern that is of particular relevance to this committee, we have a little bit of a boosted ability to advocate for investigation, legislation, and so on. So that's just an FYI for you all. Um, and let's see, yeah, we just got two more here. Bills and amendments, you can look them up. We've introduced 16 bills and amendments uh, just in this term to date. We're just a, a year into this term, a little over a year. And the House has passed four of our amendments. Uh, to the Protect the Mark Democracy Act in, in 2021. Um, next up beyond that, uh, we also have a homeowners assistance fund. This is a state level initiative, but I think it's really important that you all know. Uh, there was some reporting out of the city uh, today, uh, the city being an outlet, not the city government, <laughs> but, um, but it was showing that there is an extraordinary foreclosure crisis happening. Uh, you know, as a result of a lot of, of the suffering due to COVID uh, and the economic fallout of COVID. Unsurprisingly, it's being concentrated on working families. And as we know and as we hear from the housing market right now, it's absolutely bananas. It's crazy. And uh, and so you have this one side where you have private equity groups that are now trying to gobble up one in every seven homes in this country, driving up the price not just of purchasing homes, but also of rent. Um, but then also you have the other side, where working families who were able to buy a home or their apartment or own where they live um, are now on the precipice of foreclosure. I looked at the map this morning. There was a map that was released, and it showed the places with the least subprime uh, loans were like a light yellow, and the places with the most subprime loans were deep blue. And we looked at this map. Again, this is a, a city and state level in terms of this, but I thought it was really important to share with you all. When we saw that huge parts of the Bronx, including this neighborhood, deep blue. There's a lot of people who are struggling. And when it comes to finances, a lot of the struggle alone. There's a lot of shame associated with debt. There's a lot of shame associated with, uh, associated with being behind on their bills. And so when that happens, people kind of clam up. And we don't reach out for help when help is available or when we really need it. And so I just want anyone here to know that if you're struggling with that, help is available. 
and uh, the state authorized a homeowner's assistance fund um, over uh, this, you know, over uh, 500 million dollars is provided from New York State um, from the federal government. So we give to the state, the state is handing it out, and um, and it helps provide mortgage assistance if you're behind on your payments. So technically, that application window, like the deadline, has passed. But get on the waiting list if you need that help. The more people are on the waiting list, then the state will see there's a lot more people that still need help, and they might be able to adjust or adapt their administration of it. So that's something that was really important that I wanted you all to know. After that, uh, we've got taxes, death and taxes. Those are things that you're going to Deadline is April 18th this year. Uh, you can get free tax prep services at nyc.gov slash tax prep. Um, and if you're not filer, and we've got our tax prep folks in the back. Thank you all. Thank you so much. So don't look out. If you need help filing your taxes, just stop at that with my kid. Thank you. But, uh, but one thing that I want to let you all know, in a lot of the rescue plan legislation we passed last year, there is so much, there are so many tax credits that are available to you. So if you usually don't make enough income to file taxes, or to qualify to need to file taxes, I highly, highly encourage you to file them anyway because you might have a big refund waiting for you that you may not know about. One example was with the child tax credits. The ones that we tried to extend and a little birdie by Joe Manchin is sitting on in the Senate, um, as well as the rest of the Republican Party. Uh, but uh, we've been trying to extend those. However, the child tax credits that you got last year, that cash, may not be all of the cash that's actually available to you. So what happens is that you get that, you know, that $600 a month, what, however, whatever amount that you were receiving for your children, you may have gotten that check for a couple of months, uh, but depending on the way it was administrated to you, you may have another one, two, three grand outstanding. And so if you file your taxes, even if you usually make um, you know, too little to, to normally have to file, you may have thousands of dollars waiting for you. So talk to our tax prep folks, because they will get you money. Um, so any remaining child tax credit funds that you might have, uh, there's a recovery rebate tax credit, and there's also um, some shifts in our earned income tax credit. So it's not the same tax filing that it that it normally will be, and for a lot of people, it's going to be better than normal. So make sure that you file it, even if you don't normally file. Make sure you check in. You can even ask them and say, "Hey, listen, like, I make this much. I have, you know, two two kids. Do you think I should do it?" And they'll be able to give you some advice and some feedback um, right off the bat. So we've got that. Then um, our last slide here, it's just a quick thing. We have a annual art competition for our youth um, that gets hosted every year, the professional art competition. Uh, the deadline this year is April 29th. And you can contact your art teacher or have your children contact their art teacher to submit their entry. Um, it is a really great opportunity to engage in. Um, if your child is really gifted or talented or just really enjoys pursuing art, um, they can submit their art uh, to, to the Congressional Art Competition. Each district, each member of Congress gets to select one submission, and that submission will be hung up um, in the Capitol, and we will bring you and your family, usually, I mean, pre-COVID, I think we'll probably get back to this, but typically we bring you and your family uh, down to Washington for a commemorative ceremony. Um, and it's really wonderful if you're applying to college. It's a great thing to also have uh, in, your, in your college application as well. So this is the information for the art competition. And you've got some time, so maybe you can look up something here. Um, so that's our last slide. And then I tried to go back, but we had a lot to go over. Um, so we'll just take it off to our Q&A. But 
Thank you for your remarks, Congresswoman. We will now move to the question and answer portion of our town hall. We call the question the question slip, and I will call on the constituent with the question. My colleague Alejandro will pass the microphone to you. First question is asked by Ms. Diana Harris from Parkchester. I'll try to, I'll repeat it. Um, 
Would you handle it any differently the way you're handling right now, or would you handle it differently on how people are involved? Thank you. Okay, so uh, for folks who, who couldn't hear, um, the question was respecting Ukraine, and uh, the question was, given how the prison has handled things up to this point, is there anything that I uh, think should be handled differently, or anything that I would do differently? Uh, and I would say there, there's two fronts to it. There's what we're doing domestically, um, in terms of, of how we organize our response domestically, and then how we organize our response in terms of our foreign policy. I think given the way that and, and for the purpose of the question, I'm going to answer in terms of Biden's response in the last you know, one to two months uh, in which all of this has unfolded. And to be honest, I think that the situation has been extraordinarily difficult. And I will say that uh, the U.S. intelligence community actually handled this matter um, I think quite well, and this is a community that, you know, the U.S. intelligence community does not have a history, <laughs> maybe the most reliable, um, but in terms of this matter, uh, you know, they were right about uh, the, the probability of Putin invading Ukraine, even when a lot of our allies thought that that uh, was not, a, not something that they thought he would do. I, it's a very difficult scenario, and I believe that the president has conducted himself with restraint without getting walked over. And that's a very fine line to toe. And so I would say, so far, um, I, I don't think that he's made any major, huge uh, missteps that I would be doing. You know, there may be some small things here and there, um, but Right now, I think that at least in this immediate four to eight week window, it's difficult to see how this would play out differently. Now, that's with respect to foreign policy. In terms of our domestic response to Ukraine, there are things that I would be doing differently. Um, and one of those things is the way that we are treating Ukrainian refugees is the way that we should be treating all refugees in the United States. We should be, you know, the president announced today that it's his intent to accept 100,000 Ukrainian refugees, uh, you know, just to start uh, from the scenario we should welcome our Ukrainian, uh, our new Ukrainian uh, neighbors. But, you know, I think a lot of us coming from communities like ours, they ask, what about, what about when it's us? And even just a few months ago, we did not have this kind of announcement for Afghan families who were fleeing. Um, there wasn't this like very public declaration of a number. Or even a few years before, when very similar things were unfolding uh, with Russian intervention in Syria. What we were hearing back then, when it came to accepting Syrian refugees, was we don't have space. It was broad, vast country. You know, there isn't space, etc. And so I think we need an acknowledgement of the fact that US immigration policy is rooted, it all started with the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was racist policy. And then we tried to evolve from there. But there's a lot of that that still haunts us today from you know nation quotas, etc. You know, just now there was reporting about even there are Ukrainian folks and families coming into the southern border. And we have to be making sure that all refugee families, they're saying Title 42 exclusionary policy only applies to Mexican, Guatemalan, and, and, other, um, and other countries, but that it doesn't uh, apply to Ukrainian refugees on our southern border, border either. And so I think domestically, the thing I would be doing differently would be, I would make sure that we would be eliminating the MPP within the Mexico policy, we should be eliminating Title 42, which is, allowed, is, which is part of what allowed Haitians to be treated as poorly as they were. Um, and we need to be giving everybody the grace and the welcome and the value that our Ukrainian families uh, deserve, but also extending that to everybody. Thank you.
The next question is from Ms. Beatriz Albino.
in addition to the funds that we've gotten at places like Jacoby, but there's a lot more we can and we're more than happy to engage if you also have an additional idea. But 
we can't forget that this is our fight. And we've asked, uh, you know, I've asked the president, given the quagmire in, in the Senate, you know, we've asked him to, whatever he can sidestep in the Senate, to sidestep it. And we've provided a list of over 90 executive orders asking President Biden to sign them. Um, because we can't, we can't tell people to vote harder when their right to vote is being stripped away. You know, people are, are doing everything that they can to fight for the ballot. That's what everyday people are doing. We need to do everything that we can. And if we're still leaving fight on the table in the Senate, what are we doing? What are we doing? And so, you know, I'm sorry that I can't give you more of a substantive update, but that, I mean, that's just the situation that we're in right now. And it seems to me like people are just, <coughs> if it was me holding up the right to vote, y'all would hear that. It would be on, it would be on every TV channel. It would, like, we would be just, it would be, it would be a wrap, basically, right? But why is that privilege, the privilege of, of generosity of interpretation and all this other stuff being bestowed what is not bestowed equally? And it's a reflection of larger issues, I, I believe, of inequity, particularly racial inequity across the country. Now we'd like to invite David Michelin, who had a question on gas taxes. How you doing? I'm well, how are you? Good to see you, man. How you doing? I'm good, sir. Uh, can you use the microphone? I don't know what I need. I don't know what I need. I don't know what I need. Ms. Lincoln, I just want to make a statement about, um, I think that despite so much that, you know, Asians being targeted and all that, I think in America, we're in the 21st century, there's no place for racism, the practice of it doesn't fall under, shouldn't fall under freedom of speech or anything. It should be a card for anybody to practice or advocate racism on the state level, on the federal level. If you want to practice racism, get on a space shuttle and go to the moon. There's no place for it. That's the end of that. So, I wanted to uh, talk about the, the gas tax. In Connecticut, they just um, suspended the gas tax. So, we all know the taxes in New York is high. I tell you what I paid in taxes, and I haven't worked in a year, you probably will cry. I mean, really, right? literally. So, why can't we get the, the, the gas tax suspended here in New York for a few months or whatever? They did three months, I think, in New Jersey. I mean, no, no. I do have one more thing yeah. I'd like to say. In reference to the bar, bar store group for Barchester. So, I understand that you guys, um, that's a private entity, and unfortunately, a corporate entity controls that. So we do have an issue with the board, not representing the individual owners in, in their best interest. They're doing their own thing. So the one thing I think that you guys can do that would work, if you could provide the box store group with information about how when the board is not doing their job, that you know, how do you go about getting rid of them? Because there is a mechanism. So, so that kind of information would be more than helpful. For sure. If we had access to the law books, I, I, I would get would to research so yeah, I'll repeat, I'll repeat this question. I'll repeat this question first. Thank you. Okay, so two questions. His first question was about the gas tax. Uh, the second one uh, was a, was a follow-up to uh, the kind of Parkchester uh, fees question. So I'll always take the, the first the gas tax question first. Um, so he asked, uh, I, I believe he said New Jersey or Connecticut? Yeah, no, Connecticut suspended other states' gas tax. Can we do that in New York? Um, so that would be a, a state level action, either by the state legislature or the governor. We have the state senator, Lisa uh, Blumen, right here. Uh, so we may be able to speak about the state level a little bit better. Uh, there is a federal gas tax, um, and uh, and that federal gas tax is, is very very small. I mean, there's people are already talking about waiving it, even though it's very small. But my my opinion. Um, and I'm always open to feedback, but I feel like that's not actually what drives the price down. So what we should be doing is that we should be uh, instituting a windfall tax on gas companies 
because they're driving up their prices, saying, oh, the costs are going up, right? The costs are going up. However, their profit margins are so higher than they've ever been before. So the problem is that we eliminate the gas tax, right? Even if it's like 30 cents, 30 cents is 30 cents, right? But you eliminate the gas tax, and but that's like the that's the that's like our, our state, our state government little bit, you know, whether it's five cents, etc. But just the answer. I mean, yeah. I know what you're talking about, the Exxon Mobil. It's outrageous. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not coming out like in, you know, in opposition. But here's what my concern is: is that you shave off that five thirty cents of the interim, right? Get some of that relief. They're gonna lift it right back up, just put it right back at that price because they are setting the price. So we need to go after them. And because you wipe that gas tax, they're like, oh, well, they were paying five cents before. We can just make up. We'll raise it five cents on our end. So then they pocket the five cents, and then our public schools don't get the same amount of funding, and we're, we're still back at square one. And so what we have to actually, what I think we need to do is really go after a windfall tax with these fossil fuel CEOs, and we need to make sure that they that they stop you know running with these excuses. This idea that we need to reopen the Keystone XL pipeline, all this other stuff, we know that that's bull. First of all, it takes years to build out any pipeline. One, two, that's that specific pipeline is still one of war independence because it goes to Canada. And then three, they have nine thousand permits that they're sitting on that they're not using. So this is literally just about charging you because they want to charge you. Like, and it's not just oil and gas. Our food inflation, similar things. Our agricultural industries have been concentrated into four major conglomerate corporations. And they go on their profit calls, uh, and they go on their investor calls, and they say, this is a great time for us. They're bragging about it. They're saying this is a great time for us. And so while, yes, there are some issues that are uh, you know, tied to supply chain, our supply chain isn't still at 100%. But it's not, it doesn't not justify this absolutely bananas increase in prices that a lot of companies are doing because they're, they're, they're grabbing because they see an opportunity, they see something they can win, and it's going up. And what they, and they use this term, they say up like a rocket, down like a feather. And that's our problem because they will raise these prices up super high, and a lot of times they won't go down even when these changes have been fixed. And if they do go down, it's very, very slowly. So that that puts the you know that puts the pain in our pocket. And then you pair that with rent, it's we can't we can barely afford to stay here. And so um, I'm I'm open to it. You know we have our state senator right here. I would be love to respond to it. Uh, but my concern is that we're still letting it get away with that without behavior. Taxes. Um, the state in our one house budget resolution, we actually 